You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good morning. Romans chapter 12 is where we are this morning in our study of God's Word. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we have been in the book of Romans for some time now. We have made our way to this 12th chapter, and we're reading this morning beginning at verse 9, down to verse 21, verse 13 will be our focus this morning, but let's read beginning with the ninth verse, Romans chapter 12. God's Word says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Verse 13 says again, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Lord, I know represented in this congregation are not only many joys from this past week, thankful hearts. Lord, I think about the baptisms we just witnessed and how grateful we are to you for your grace and mercy to us and to all those who are added to our number. Our lives are full of joys and mercies that we meet with every morning. But I also know that there are many sorrows represented in this room. I think about those in our congregation who are sick right now, some seriously ill. We pray for them. We pray for their families. We pray that you would have mercy upon us by restoring them, those who are ill, to to full health and to their place here with us. But we know even as we ask for that, that you love them more than we do. You love them perfectly. And so we bow before your sovereign will and we trust them to your care. And we know that you always do what is best. We ask for their healing, but we leave that with you, Lord. Comfort and encourage their families while they are ill. 
We pray, Lord, for this time we have now before your word. You meet needs through the preaching of your word. You affirm joys with the knowledge of your goodness, and you grant peace to troubled hearts through the knowledge of your faithfulness. And I just pray that as your word goes forth today, the needs represented in this room would be met. I pray especially for those who are lost and who are in need of the forgiveness of their sins, for reconciliation with you, for your son, we ask that you would save. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When the Lord saved us, he brought us into his love. It's an amazing thought, isn't it, that in God, in the triune God, there is everlasting love, love that had no beginning, love that will have no end. And when the Lord saved us, he brought us into fellowship with himself, which is to say we were introduced into this Trinitarian love. We were introduced into this divine love. And the Bible says that his love was poured out in our hearts. So not only brought into his love, but given his love so that now we experience that love in our own hearts. We know what it is to love others with the love that God has given us from himself. We've learned and been reminded that the aim of our charge, the aim of our preaching is love. We've seen from the book of Ephesians, as we were considering spiritual gifts here in Romans, we've seen that the outcome of the proper operation of spiritual gifts is the body building itself up in love. It's true to say that the Christian life considered as a whole is a life of love, which is why as we've come to this list of exhortations that ends the 12th chapter of Romans, beginning with the ninth verse all the way down to the end, as we've considered each one of these, we've thought about these exhortations in the context of the love of God. The list begins there. Verse 9 says, let love be genuine. Everything else that follows really is an expression of that unhypocritical love that God would have us to walk in. When Paul expands his focus a bit in the 13th chapter and we're instructed about how to live as believers in this world especially how we engage government in this world. He talks about giving honor to those who deserve honor and all the rest. When he, when he sort of brings that section to its close, he reminds us again that all of this is summed up in the terms of love. Chapter 13, verse 8 says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. You shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. The Christian life is a life of love. We have considered so far six expressions then of the love of God. We've talked about the fact that love is Without hypocrisy, verse 9, it's genuine. It's not something we pretend, put on, wear like a mask. The Christian life is lived from the inside out. It's the Lord actually having given us His love, now teaching us to walk in that love. We're to make sure that what we're living out is real. Let love be genuine. Love is pure. For walking in the love of God will be abhorring what is evil. We'll be holding fast to what is good. We'll marry ourselves to what is good in His sight. I just would remind us again that the, the love of God never affirms sin. The love of God rejoices not in iniquity, but in that which is true and right in the sight of God. Love, God's love is pure. It's holy. It's warm. It's not cold. Verse 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Where you have the love of God, you have hearts full of affection, one for another. We've been brought into the same spiritual family. We should love each other with brotherly affection, as brothers and sisters in Christ. This love is not jealous. 
It is willing to honor others. In fact, it rejoices in the honor of others. Paul writes, outdo one another in showing honor. Not competing with each other. We rejoice in God's good work in each other's lives. And so it's not selfish. It's not jealous. It's zealous. Verse 11 says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. When you walk in the love of God, you're not mildly committed to Christ. You're not living your life with a heart uh, that would sort of be expressed with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. No, you're serving the Lord with zeal. And in all that you do, you serve Him. And that's why that verse ends with serve the Lord. Whatever it is you do in life, eating, drinking, or anything else, you do for the glory of God. And so you're serving the Lord when you go to your work. On Monday. You're serving the Lord as you live your life in marriage. You're serving the Lord as you raise your children. You're serving the Lord as you engage in your friendships. It's all service to Him. That's the mindset, that's the standard, that's the aim. And you do this zealously, not lazily. And then we saw last time in verse 12 that this love is steadfast. Where you have the love of God, you have stability. Where you have the love of God, you have a growing maturity. This is seen in a joy that's not found in present circumstances. It's fixed in its hope, verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Hope, the future counted certain, considered to be certain because of what God has said. We, we don't know what the future holds in one sense, but we do know what it holds in an ultimate sense. Whatever it is that we meet with tomorrow, we know will represent something for our good and for God's glory, and we know where we're all ultimately headed. And so no matter how difficult it is in the moment, we keep our eyes fixed on eternity. We know a joy that's fixed in eternity, fixed not on what we can see, but on what we cannot see, not on the present, but on forever, that kind of joy. And that results in a patience that we can know in all of our troubles an ability to remain under the trial, an ability to remain submitted to Christ and to His Word, no matter what it is we're going through, patience in tribulation, and all of this is fueled by and requires constancy in prayer. It is our communion with God that allows us to know that joy and that patience that can exist even in the harshest circumstances. This is God's love in action. This is the Christian life. And now this morning we come to another quality of God's love. When Paul writes, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. We could sum up those two exhortations under one heading and say this, love is generous. God's love is generous in nature. Where you have the love of God, you have giving. People walking in the love of God will be givers. This is what God's love teaches us. This is how we're taught to live. A life of sharing, a life of imparting, a life of giving. I want to begin this morning considering that um, from the standpoint of, of the entire New Testament, I want us to see that this is not just given voice to in verse 13, but it's voiced again and again throughout the New Testament, that where you have the love of God, you have generosity. And then we'll come back to verse 13, and we're going to see two, two specific expressions of that generosity. But let's begin, first of all, just in a general sense, the, the generous nature of love. The fact that love is not selfish, love is not stingy, love does not hoard God teaches us to give and to share and to meet the needs of others. Now, I would just pause for a moment and ask you, is that how you're living your life right now? Is that how you think about life? Are you thinking mostly about yourself, what you consider to be your needs, your wants, your desires? Is that where your focus is really as you live your life every day? Or are you, think, or are you thinking instead outwardly? 
away from yourself, about others, and how God might use you to make a contribution to someone else's life. How is your life oriented? We see many examples in the New Testament that where where you have the love of God, you have a life that focuses on others and wants to make a contribution. For example, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul meets with the Ephesian elders for the last time, it's amazing how he is able to say to them, you can remember my example. There I was, living with you, ministering with you. Can you remember the example I strived to set for you? It comes to the matter of, of helping others. Acts 20 verse 32 says this, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And then he writes this, or then we read this, Luke wrote it, but what Paul said, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Right? I didn't want what you had. That wasn't my example, wanting what you had. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. Paul not only worked so that his own needs would be met, but that he could help those who worked with him. And then he says this, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. I wanted to teach you this by example, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when you work hard, you're not working hard just to take care of yourself, just to provide things for yourself, but you work hard to be able to help the weak and make a contribution to to the lives of others. Some listening to me this morning, you work very hard. You go to work every day and you work very hard. And I wonder in all of that hard work where you think about the proceeds that come from that, where you think about those things being distributed. Do you think about simply those things being spent on yourself or do you think about that all of this hard work might be used by God to help someone who needs, needs help? Paul set a good example. This is the pattern for believers in general. Ephesians 4.28 says, let the thief no longer steal. Right? You have a man who's a thief, but now the Lord has saved him. Obviously, his life of thievery should come to an end. Stop stealing. Let the thief no longer steal. But listen to now what the contrast is. But rather, let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that, purpose statement is coming here, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You go from being a thief to a giver. You work hard not just to now honestly earn a living, but to be able to help other people. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. This is a part of shepherding. That if you see laziness in the congregation, if you see idleness in the congregation, we're to admonish that. We're to deal with that. Help people get out of that. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. I love this. Be patient with them all takes time for people to learn to no longer live lazy lives. It takes time for people who are faint-hearted to find their strength in the Lord. It helps. It takes time for the weak to be helped. Be patient with them all. But again, there's that outward focus, that outward orientation, helping others. This is how, in fact, believers are taught to think about material things in general Why has God given us what he's given us? 
Some of you right now are living your life in a season of plenty. The Lord has blessed you and is blessing you, and you really don't have lack. You have what you need, and you have more. You are in a season of abundance. No doubt someone is hearing me this morning that you're in a season of uh, leanness from the standpoint of material things. You're struggling right now. Maybe even there's someone listening to me that you're wondering how you're going to make it to the 15th or how you're going to make it to next month. So, so there's a variety represented in the congregation, no doubt, people listening to my voice. How are we to think about what the Lord has supplied for us? 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. As, don't be proud. Don't think of this as a commentary on you. I have a lot. It must mean that God's really happy with me. It must mean that I'm really living a better life than someone who's struggling. That's why I have what I have. No, don't think like that. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Maybe you feel real confident right now. I mean, you don't feel like there's any danger because you have what you need. In fact, you could even absorb a few difficult, you know, circumstances along the way because you've built up enough that there's a sense of security there. It's like a strong tower in your mind. You're safe financially. He says, don't do that. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches. You know, it could all fly away tomorrow. I know you can't envision that perhaps right now, but it, it could all be gone tomorrow. Don't put your hope there. He goes on to write this, but on God. That's where you set your hope. On God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I love that. He also is not saying here, now you need to feel really guilty if you have a lot. You must be doing something wrong if you have a lot. You must be sinning in some way. He doesn't say that. He says, set your hope on God who gives us all things, richly, everything, to enjoy. You do know that enjoyment is not ruled out of our lives by our God. He does not say that we can't have things to enjoy. It's not what he says. But here is how we're to think. Verse 18 they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What you have is not life. Life is found in God. Life is found in Christ. Life is found in serving Him. That's life. Don't, let, don't loosen your grip on what is really life to hold tightly to what is not life. And you be ready to take what God has given to you and share it, to be generous. And as you do that, what you're actually doing is demonstrating where your treasure is. You're storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future. What future? Your eternal future. Take your temporal wealth and make use of it with eternity in mind. That's what he says. And all of this flows out of an understanding that we have been rescued through sacrifice. How, how were our sins forgiven? How are we taken from the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's own Son? How do we now stand before God accepted, stationed in His grace, brought into this life of love? How did it happen? didn't happen without giving. didn't happen without sacrificial giving. Because it required the Son of God, the eternal Son, to step from heaven into this world that he made and take to himself a nature like ours that he might live for us and then die for us. He himself paying for all of our sins. He himself saving us from the very wrath of himself, the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of God by the giving of his own life. 
so that by his blood our sins are washed away. It's with his sacrifice in mind, it's with his giving in mind that we are taught to be givers. And I mean, this is emphasized enormously in the New Testament. Look real quickly at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 so you can see this with your eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And look at verse 1. Paul writes here, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Offering been taken up for poor saints in Jerusalem. Gentiles having the opportunity to make a contribution. There are some severely afflicted believers in Macedonia, severely afflicted from the standpoint of financial lack material lack, and yet they begged for the opportunity to participate. In their poverty, they wanted to give. Verse 2, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now, you, you just stop and let that sink in. If somebody's begging you to participate, if they're having to beg you to participate, what do you think is going on on the other side of that conversation? No, 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 no. Look, the Lord knows. The Lord knows what your circumstances are. The Lord knows the extreme poverty you're in right now. This is probably not something for you to participate in. Not right now. And what are they saying? Oh, let us. Let us. Let us take part in this. And they do it with joy. It's completely of their own accord. It's not forced. Verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us, not only willing to participate from a financial point of view, but is there any way we can help personally? We put ourselves at your disposal. How can we be used? Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Paul now using the Macedonians as a testimony to the Corinthians. And so he's exhorting the Corinthians, and he says this, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others, by the example of the Macedonians, that your love is also genuine. Do you notice he puts this in the terms of love? This opportunity to give, this opportunity to participate in this offering, he calls it love. Prove the genuineness of your love, verse 9, for you know the grace. Here, here's what I mean by the example of sacrifice. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. There it is. How did you become rich? How did you become rich in Jesus Christ? It was through his sacrifice. It was through his giving. His giving enriched you. His poverty made for your richness. And he says, let that be your example. Let you keep that in mind. Bear that in mind when you think about meeting someone else's need. John 15, 13 says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. 1 John 3, 16 says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. 
Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Don't just remember that Jesus died for you. Imitate it. That's sobering and humbling, isn't it? Imitate it. 2 Corinthians 12, 15 says, I will, Paul, an example of this, I will, he writes, most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. And as he writes those words, understand, he's writing to a congregation in which there are still some who are mistreating the apostle, who are disrespecting him, who have believed the worst about him, who believe the false teachers as, as they have slandered him. He says, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? I'm going to love you if you don't love me. I'm going to give to you. I'm going to be spent for you. Even if you don't return my love. So that this generosity is taught to us by our Savior, by the gospel, by the cross, by the incarnation, by his suffering. It's not just being grateful for the forgiveness of your sins. It's living out your gratefulness for the forgiveness of your sins. By meeting the needs of other people, remembering you'll never. I mean, what he has done for you is, is infinitely, it infinitely surpasses what you and I could ever do for someone else. All of this is to be done with a liberality that says we rejoice in it. God's love is not like natural love. Natural love is very measured, hesitant, stingy, reluctant, sometimes even regretful. You meet a need and later on you wish you still had the money. Well, God's love is not like that. It's sacrificial, eagle, eager, liberal. Romans 12, 8 says, speaking of the use of our gifts, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality. And this, this is, as I said, we're not all gifted the same, but we're all meant to benefit from each other's gift. Someone who's really gifted in the area of giving, I mean, they give with liberality, with joy. And that's to teach the rest of the body what giving looks like if it really expresses the love of God. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? cheerful giver, a cheerful giver. God loves. Do you, do you want to love what God loves? Do you want to live out what God loves? He loves a cheerful giver. So when you just look at the New Testament as a whole, what do you find? You find that love is generous. Love is generous. And we think about our material provision, not just as, some, not as a commentary on ourselves and not just for ourselves, but an expression of God's grace and then to be used for God's glory, for the good of others, and for the advancement of the gospel and for the advancement of God's kingdom. There are eternal things that can be accomplished with temporal wealth. Now we look at our verse, Romans 12, look at verse 13. We find two specific ways in which that generosity is spoken of. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The first thing we find in verse 13 is a partnership spoken of, a partnership. Contribute to the needs of the saints 
Koinonuntes is the word, it's a participle there, translated contribute. Form of the word koinoneo. You may recognize that word. It's a word that speaks of fellowship. Speaks of sharing in something together. And when you use that word with, in, in connection with material things, it means to participate together in a project or in giving or whatever the case may be, however those material means are being used. So it's a fellowship in the realm of material things. God is saying to us here that as believers, when we see His people in need, contributing to the needs of the saints, when you see the saints, God's people, saved people, when you see them in need, we're to think of our giving to meet those needs as a fellowship. Say, so in what way would it be a fellowship? I think in two ways. One, we give to them remembering our, because we're talking about the saints now, our fellowship together in Christ. A partnership, a communion in the family of God. I'm not just meeting anybody's needs. I'm meeting the needs of a brother or a sister. I, I bear in mind our partnership in life, our partnership in ministry, our partnership in this family of grace that is the family of God. We are together in this. And I realize that I'm not, whatever contribution I make, I'm not the only conduit of help that they have. The Lord might be using me in this one particular instance, but He's using, He can use anybody, and He uses His entire family to meet the needs of His people. And so I'm also in a partnership with anybody else who helps them. So it's a fellowship both between myself and the person I'm helping, talking about fellow saints, and it's a partnership with anybody else in the family of God that God may use to meet their need. Together, we meet needs. Together, we meet the needs of people who are precious to us because we belong to the same family. The Jewish people, we learn in Acts chapter 18, the Jewish people were dispersed from Rome during the reign of Claudius. That would have included Jewish Christians. It's possible that by the time Paul writes this letter, you have these Jewish believers returning back to Rome and because they were displaced, they, they lost a lot. Now they find themselves with many needs. This would be an opportunity for Gentile believers to meet those needs. And this is what the love of God would, would require of, God, uh, of His people to meet those needs. How can we help? This is something we, we saw early in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 44, this, this belonged to the earliest life of the church, this kind of care, this kind of love. Acts 2, 44 says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Let me just pause and say that. So you, you have pilgrims making their way to the city of Jerusalem for Passover. Christ dies there, is raised from the dead. Now the gospel is being preached on the day of Pentecost. People are being converted. And you have, at this time, you've got one church. And they want to stay. They want to devote themselves to the things that they're hearing. So what was required if these people were to stay? Needs had to be met. Verse 45, Acts 2, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Imagine that. You're not just giving out of your surplus. You are liquidating what you have to meet these needs. To do that, you have to have an eternal perspective. You would have had to have understood the significance of this first church, the significance of this first season of discipleship. So important was it that your earthly material possessions meant less to you than making sure these people were able to remain there. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Read about it again in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. I mean, you're talking about something supernatural. Because they not only sold this stuff, they brought the proceeds and laid it down at the feet of the apostles and said, now it is yours to distribute as you think best. It wasn't, you know, they weren't Baptists, that's for sure. <laughs> that give with one hand and hold on to it with the other. Here it is. And now I'm going to control how it's used. No, they just laid it down. Houses, lands, they just laid it down. The apostles proved themselves trustworthy in the way they used it. And do you notice that when this supernatural generosity is on display, really unrepeatable, I don't know that you'll ever see another time exactly like that in the history of the world, but as that's taking place, do you notice at the very same time, God is moving mightily in the saving of sinners. I mean, the Lord is pleased with this and His hand is on this. He's using it. What do those passages teach us? Do they teach us communism? Everybody had everything together. I mean, they all they didn't count anything as being their own. Is that what we're being taught in those passages? Not at all. It was about meeting needs. That's it. A unique, unique time in history, one church in the whole world. It was needful that people remain there as the gospel begins to be taught. The new covenant truths begin to be impressed upon the minds of people. The Old Testament is brought into a right focus. In light of what Christ is doing, it was, it was needful, and people were willing to sacrifice to see real needs being met. It wasn't communism. It was the church being the church. Though that unique circumstance is not where we find ourselves today, the mindset that what God gives me in the material realm is not just for me, that remains. That should be our mindset right now. 2 Corinthians 8.11 says this. Why don't you turn there again? I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 11. Paul continuing to impress upon this church the need to complete what they co committed to do. In terms of that offering for those poor saints, he says this, verse 11, So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. That's a good word, isn't it? Sometimes we're better desirers, right? We desire better to give than, than actually doing it. Make sure your desire is matched by completing what you committed to, verse 12, for if the readiness is there, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. That is completed to the extent that you're able. You can't give what you don't possess. Just be faithful. Next verse, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. 
This is an amazing thought. What if God has supplied for you right now in an abundant fashion to meet someone's need who is not in the same place, only down the road to see their abundance supply for your need when you have it? Is this our idea of fellowship, that we love each other, we're a part of a family, the family of God, and God supplies for each of us, not just for us, but for others, so that when we see someone with a genuine need and we have abundance, we say, Lord, I'm willing to be that means that you use to meet their need, and Lord, I know this, I don't have to be afraid to do it. I mean, how do you sell houses and lands and not be afraid? I don't have to be afraid to do it because when I have a need, you will meet it. And you may indeed use these people to meet my need when it exists. It may not be them. Maybe someone else. You're the one who meets my needs. So I don't have to be afraid to be used by you to meet the needs of others because you're the one who meets all of our needs. Verse 15 of that text, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. You know what that's called? That's called a family. We, isn't it amazing? We understand this in our natural families. I have four children. I have eight grandchildren. Two are in the oven, okay? Six have emerged. Two are in the oven. And I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing I have that doesn't belong to them too. Nothing. Isn't that how you think about it as your family? What do I have that is not theirs? What, do, what could you give me that I wouldn't just turn and give to them? Why? Because we love each other. Is this really a family or just pretend I'm talking the family of God? Is it really a family or are we just pretending? If you believe it's a real family, would you say amen? amen. It's a real family. Now, how then? How then? Could we not have that same attitude with each other? What do I have that's not at your disposal if you need it? And I'll trust God to take care of me when it comes my turn. In fact, it is so real, what we're talking about is so real, that if that is not your mindset as a pattern, I mean consistently, what it reveals is, you don't have salvation. 1 John 3, 17 says this, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You see someone, you say, your brother, your sister, they have a need, you have the means to meet it, and you don't care? And you say you have the love of God? In fact, did you know, though you're to have a heart that cares for all people and there, there, there is a time to be a blessing to people outside the family of God, did you know that God wants you to prioritize meeting the needs of His people? You say, you see, you say God really has a priority structure? I mean, He wants me to prioritize and emphasize the needs of His saints? That's right doesn't mean you can't help somebody else, but the priority is the family of God. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by your love for them. Is that what the Bible says? By your love for one another. Yeah, I mean, the world looks at how the church loves itself and has to marvel and say, what kind of love is that? I mean, I see these people meeting each other's needs in a way I can't even imagine. What kind of love is that? Galatians 6.10 says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. What does our verse say? Romans chapter 12, contribute to the needs of the saints. The needs of the saints. Now, even it's, it is a unique generosity because it is not a generosity that's naive. 
It's not a generosity that is without standards. It's not a generosity, let me say it to you this way, it's not a generosity that would ever confirm someone in sin, right? The love of God doesn't confirm sin. That's true in the material realm too. So it's not a kind of generosity that would confirm someone in their laziness. It's not a kind of generosity that would confirm someone in their irresponsibility. It's, it's a love that disciples. It's a love that has to discern. It's a love that develops people. We're to be patient even where there's laziness. We may have to do some teaching, but you don't excuse the laziness. Second, Th- Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7 says this, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. What healthy, natural family doesn't have discipline? You you have to teach your children a work ethic. And the same is true in the church. So it is enormously generous but it's not naive. It is enormously generous, but it doesn't confirm people in their wrong. The love of God is generous, and it begins, verse 13, with this participation, this fellowship when it comes to the needs of the saints. They're part of God's family, and together as God's family, we meet each other's needs, and we view our material things as given to us, not just for us, but for use. And yet we do it responsibly and wisely and in a way that help, truly helps people. Second, very quickly, notice the second expression of this generous love in verse 13. He writes, and seek to show hospitality. This, this is love's giving, but even in a more personal way. Now, it's not just giving out of my material abundance, or poverty as it was with the Macedonians, but it's giving of myself. Now it's not just meeting your need out there, it's bringing you into the Lord's kindness to me. It's bringing you into my home. It's bringing you into my life. It's bringing you into my family. Hospitality. And and this is very interesting. Do you see there in verse 13 where it says, seek to show, in the ESV, seek to show? translates the word dioko, and it's a word that means to chase, to hunt, to pursue. The word for hospitality, philoxenia is the word, made up of two words, and it, it literally means love of strangers. So now, I, I, now it, what's being envisioned is, I love a fellow believer not because I know them well, They're really a stranger to me. But I love them because they're a part of the family of God. I love them as a brother or sister, though I don't know them very well. And I don't mildly care about them. I am looking for ways to care for them. Seek to show hospitality. Seek to show hospitality, something you're proactive about. You're not laying back and saying, I'll be hospitable if needed. You're looking for ways to be hospitable. One one commentator wrote this, hospitality 
was a key feature of Jesus' ministry, both in his dependence on it, gives several references, and in his practice and commendation of it as a model of divine generosity. The early mission would likewise depend on such hospitality, since inns were often held in bad repute. Travelers and merchants would obviously hope for hospitality from fellow countrymen. The demand on the ethnic subgroups in Rome and in this connection would probably be considerable, hence perhaps the need to press the obligation on his readers. Dioko, pursue, strive for, seek after, aspire to. Subsequently, hospitableness is regarded as a desirable characteristic in a bishop or an elder, 1 Timothy 3. Willing to open up our homes to meet the needs of others. People traveling th through that world, the inns are dangerous. I need a place to stay, maybe a traveling minister of the Word of God or maybe just a brother or sister making their way through. I need some place safe for my family. And believers are being taught to keep an eye out for that and to be willing to help. It's just another mark of God's love, just another mark of love's generosity. Some of, some, someone might say, well, how do we practice this today? I mean, Holiday Inn's pretty safe. Merritt Courtyard's pretty nice. People don't need that anymore. How do we practice this? Well, let's just think about this as a church. Are we aggressively seeking to make this a congregation where new people feel welcome? They're not looking for an inn in which to stay, but they've come to our church. They don't know many people. They're new. You have your season tickets. You know where you sit, sit every Sunday. But they don't, they don't even know where the various buildings are on the property. Are you looking for ways to make them feel at home? Are you striving? Are you looking for opportunities? Are you looking for people like that? You know what? Here's, here's what breaks my heart. I think we've come to define hospitality as hanging out a lot with the people we know really well. I'm hospitable. We have people in our home every week. Who are they? Where'd they come from? How long have you known them? And in many cases, what's being called hospitality is really you just enjoying your friends. I'm saying, are you on the lookout for people who don't yet fit in, who don't yet know someone, who need a friend? And doing it without fanfare. If you're really hospitable, you don't have to tell everybody. Just practice it. Be hospitable. This is the mark of a healthy church. This is the mark of a church that does more than just hears the Word of God. It internalizes it and practices it. It loves the stranger. And this is why we have some of the practical ministries we have. This is why we have parking lot greeters, people who meet people out front in the foyer. And I pray and I trust and I've seen it, but... I pray that we do that with a smile and with joy. This is someone's first time here. That's why we have Bible fellowship groups. So that in a congregation this side, we're not huge, but it's large enough that if you don't begin to break relationships down to a smaller level, you can come every week and still feel alone. And so we have our Bible fellowship groups so that people can come not only for Bible study, not a teaching spot, but a place to, to begin to get worked into the fabric of the life of this church. This is how you ought to think about your service in nursery. You're, you're making it possible for someone perhaps who's here for the first time to actually sit in the worship service and hear the Word of God without distraction and sing praises without distraction. You have an opportunity to love someone that way by your service over there. And, you, and you're willing to do it because you see it, you see, as a partnership. Not only do we all belong to the same family, but we all have the privilege to meet the needs that are present in the family. Because, after all, Jesus met our needs. 
at great cost. A sacrifice that we'll never get our minds and hearts around completely. He laid down his life for us, and we are taught by that to lay down our lives for each other. And in fact, it becomes a test of whether we've received his sacrifice at all. If we can see a brother or sister in need and our heart is closed, how does the love of God abide in us? Love is generous. Love gives. Love doesn't look here. Love looks out there and reflects Christ's love to us in our giving to others. And the church would say, let's pray. Every one of us, Lord, who is your child, we, we know these things from your own kindness to us. We were weary wanderers in sin, and you brought us home, gave us a home, forgave us of our sins, reconciled us to you, and brought us into Trinitarian love, shed your love abroad in our hearts made us as unbelievable as it is, your children, and joined us to each other in that way. We are brothers and sisters. This is real. And we all know, every one of us, the one preaching this message and the ones hearing it, that we fail at this in many ways. And so we ask you to grow us, to forgive us, for our stinginess and our hoarding and our thoughtlessness about others and at times, Lord, our selfishness. And would you grow us in being a people who give, that the atmosphere and the, the entire tenor of our lives would be that we are a giving people, a welcoming people. Help us, Lord, to have an eye out for anyone who is on the outside, but it belongs to our family. And lead us in a way that that would break our hearts and that we would work hard uh, to see that not be the case. I pray for anyone, Lord, who is really on the outside today. They, they do not belong to the family of God. They have not received the forgiveness of their sins by the death of your son. Perhaps they've heard the gospel many times, but they have not given heed to the command of the gospel to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. And I pray for them today that you would grant them a heart broken over their sinfulness, that they would repent of their sin to receive forgiveness by the blood of your son. And then, Lord, may we love them well. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.